Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinion and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababala Subramanian and Maria Digby we bring you CRAMSurge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. We are doing a series on introduction to evidence-based medicine, right? Um, and therefore, this is a continuation of that series. And this talk is going to be focusing uh, on acquiring evidence. So, so acquiring evidence falls under the second stage, a step two in the practice of evidence-based medicine. You've heard from me before that there are five steps. Or you're probably aware of this. And they include asking the right clinical question, acquiring the evidence, and then appraising and interpreting the evidence, applying it to your practice, and then assessing or evaluating uh, the whole process, right? So those are the five steps of EBM. And we're going to talk a little bit about acquiring evidence. Now, why would you need to acquire evidence? So you might need to acquire evidence when you wanted to understand a topic better, you wanted to uh, um, understand the background of a clinical condition or, or an operation or a complication, right? So you can improve your understanding. So as a trainee, you might see a patient, let's say with abdominal pain due to a rare condition called uh, porphyria and you know nothing about porphyria, so you wanted to read about it. Uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be looking at a problem from a thyroid cancer perspective, and I'm going to be uh, talking about um, doing central neck dissections in thyroid cancer, and, and, and then therefore uh, that'll be my example. So if you've not come across central neck dissection before and you've assisted um, your consultant, you want to know what a central neck dissection is, what's it, its role in thyroid cancer, so therefore you would uh, like an overview of this particular topic, right? So this kind of question falls under the category of what we call background questions, as opposed to another kind of question that falls under the category of foreground questions. So there you have a specific clinical question. Uh, you have uh, observed, for example, the surgeon using drains uh, in the neck after doing a central neck dissection, and then there's been some controversy and another surgeon in the firm says, there's not much point putting drains in and therefore you want to um, uh, look into whether a drain is of value in a central like that section. So these kind of questions will aid your clinical decision-making. You might even want to perform a systematic review on this particular controversy of whether to put drain in following a central like that section. Okay, so a typical foreground question in this kind of scenario would be, should a drain be used after central neck dissection in thyroid cancer surgery? Right, so uh, with the background question, like the one that I've mentioned, what is the central neck compartment and what is the role of central neck dissection in thyroid cancer? Essentially, the answers revolve around the boundaries of the central compartment, the anatomy or the organs that lie within the central compartment, the indications of central neck dissection, its utility in clinical practice, the various approaches, techniques, risks, and so on and so forth. So for this, the thing to go uh, to would be a textbook. Uh, at least in the olden days. So you could look up an anatomy textbook to start off with, and then a surgical textbook or both. Um, and these could be very generic books or they could be specialty specific books. There are books on thyroid cancer surgery that you could look into. Another uh, source and a source that is more often used these days are topic reviews. These are narrative or educational topic reviews as opposed to a systematic review that we've just heard about. And these topic reviews often give an overview and very detailed explanations. And some of the more recent ones will include updates on new advances and also touch upon the controversies uh, around doing central neck dissections. Okay, now whether you go into to a textbook or look for a review really depends on uh, your needs, uh, at what level of training you are, uh, you know, your experience, and also access, because some of these detailed topic reviews are behind a uh, paywall and you may not get access to that. 
So um, what about uh, a foreground question? Now, I've said previously in one of uh, my other talks that a foreground question need, uh, needs to be uh, very uh, clearly structured. So this uh, may be an example of a structured foreground question that I've uh, mentioned before. Does the use of a drain after sentinel dissection in thyroid surgery reduce the risk of bleeding and wound collection? So that's a very clear question. And to answer this, you might go and look for a systematic review and meta-analysis like the one we just heard. And that would be ideal if there was a systematic review or meta-analysis. Often there isn't. And then you are left with looking at primary research articles, good quality primary research articles that specifically focus on this particular question. So um, how do you identify these um, papers, either systematic reviews or primary articles by searching um, one of various online databases. Now, when you're doing literature searching um, and you want to read about literature searching, now, if you have to do a search to conduct a very comprehensive systematic review or to write a clinical practice guideline for a society, for example, they can be quite complex. And some of these comprehensive searches, such as those done for systematic reviews for complex interventions might require specialist skills and experience. And you've got information specialists that actually will do the searching for a systematic reviewer. However, what we need to do as practicing clinicians is do some very simple searches, some very practical, sorry, searches to address practical questions. And we can effectively search literature using some um, really straightforward techniques, which with practice we can improve upon and improve the efficiency of our searches and their usefulness as well. So that's what we're gonna be looking at. Now there are various search techniques. And whenever there are various methods to address a problem, uh, you can conclude that there's no one optimum way. Yeah. And what method you choose really depends on precisely what your needs are, um, the time you've got, and um, whether you've got any additional money to pay for some papers, and, and then the overall feasibility. And um, I would say that these methods are all complementary. So there's no one perfect method, like I said. These are not mutually exclusive. And I'm going to mention a few um, techniques um, and then uh, uh, just very briefly um, discuss that in the context of central -like dissection in thyroid cancer surgery. So one of the most basic techniques is what we call basic searching, where you do a really quick search to find a couple of good articles that you can then read about overnight and then go and talk to your boss the next day. That'll help you improve understanding of the topic. And to do that, you just need a couple of uh, key phrases, something like dissection and thyroid uh, cancer, and you might put that in PubMed or Google and see if you can get a couple of good articles fairly quickly. Another thing, uh, another technique uh, that is often used um, is called berry picking, where following a basic search, you scan the searches to pick up some articles of interest. And this may be based on some certain specific features. It may be that you find uh, an article written by an author you know, like maybe Geo Perrin, and you know that Geo Perrin is a, uh, writes very well, so you can just pick up the articles that he's written. Or you might focus your attention on a particular technique of uh, sentinel -like dissection, and then explore that technique a bit further and look at similar articles on that specific technique. So clearly, berry picking is very subjective. It is completely based on your needs and your interest. Uh, it, you can use it to explore topics that you're not familiar at all with. Another technique um, in this regard is something called pearl growing. You may have heard of this. So essentially, um, you start off with a very focused, precise search to find a paper, an index paper, which is the pearl. And you read the paper and you identify keywords and then you modify your own search and continue the process, get a few more papers, and then see if you can uh, um, identify more uh, useful, relevant keywords and search further afield. Now, in, with our example, in the context of central -like dissection in thyroid cancer, you may land uh, on a paper describing a very specific central -like dissection technique. 
And looking at the paper, you find certain additional terms like maybe radical central length dissection or limited central length dissection or thymus preserving central length dissection. And you use these additional terms to search further. Also, in some databases like PubMed, there is a feature called related articles or similar articles. So you can click on those and you might get some more papers that are very closely uh, related to the index article. Another technique uh, and a phrase that you'll probably come across if you're doing systematic reviews is something called citation searching or snowballing. Basically, what it means is that, let's say you've got a specific article in hand and you want to find uh, all articles that are very similar to this article. So you can do either what is called backward searching where you look at this specific article's list of references and search for articles of interest, or you look forward, forward searching, where you look at the sites or papers that have cited the specific article. And this helps you to identify similar manuscripts. And a lot of people say that this is uh, nowadays considered mandatory if you're doing a systematic review. And then this will ensure that no articles of interest are missed. I've got two more, I think. So uh, hopefully this is not too um, monotonous. The next technique is what we call concept building or building blocks. So here, what you do is you first frame certain concepts and then you put the concepts together to formulate an effective search strategy. And this is what is typically used in systematic review searches alongside other techniques, but this is the main technique. So the concepts um, around the problem that we are talking about now are, for example, thyroid cancer, central neck dissection, drain, and, and maybe complications or bleeding and so on. But finally, and I won't dwell on this, but there is a technique uh, called successive fractions. I've not used this uh, before, but essentially what they say is this is a variant of concept building. So you have these concepts, or some people call them facets, where the concepts are added or removed in steps. So you start off with a very specific initial concept and then uh, you, you can add other concepts or drop some concepts as well. Also, um, what they say with this technique is that you can partition your searches to make things more manageable. Because sometimes you land up with 100,000 or 500,000 hits and uh, um, you're a bit stuck, you're not really sure what to do. So what you can do is you can partition the searches. For example, if your main focus is central leg dissection, you can do a search that is looking at central leg dissection and technique, another search that's looking at central leg dissection and complications, and a third one looking at central leg dissection and indications and so on. And this typically would be part of a scoping review. And then you can decide which ones you really have the ability to focus on which ones you would like to uh, drop off. Okay, so let's come back to our structured foreground clinical question, which is whether to do a drain or not to drain a central neck compartment after a neck dissection, and does that have an impact on the outcomes? Okay, so the concepts. So the concepts here, um, uh, I hope you'd agree, are one is central neck dissection, in thyroid cancer. So you can do central neck dissection in um, laryngeal resections or pharyngeal resections, but we're talking here of just thyroid cancer. So you could consider these as two concepts. Another concept is drain. That's like the intervention. And then a third concept could be uh, one or more outcomes like bleeding, wound collections, reoperation, and so on. Now let's put these concepts in a table. So the first one you've got is central neck dissection. So you've got to think about keywords or different ways of describing central neck dissection. So you could just call it neck dissection, or you could say dissection of the central compartment. Another name for central neck is level six and seven. So that could be another name and so on. So again, for thyroid cancer, um, papers could refer to thyroid cancer, or they could refer just to papillary thyroid cancer, which is where the neck dissection is primarily performed. Or they might just say thyroid malignancy. So those are the different ways of describing this particular concept. And then you've got drain. You've got lots of different words for drain, draining, drainage, suction tube, and so on. And obviously you've got outcomes, but just to keep this short, uh, I won't go any further with the concepts. Now you will find that there's another empty column here that refers to medical subject headings. 
So before I go on to list medical subject headings, we need to talk about what they are very briefly. So medical subject headings are just another name for control vocabulary. So control vocabulary is used by um, uh, the databases, um, um, which is essentially a set of specific terms. And uh, it, they're simply called MESH in PubMed. That's all it is. Medical subject headings is just another name for control vocabulary. So essentially, it refers to a single specific concept that encompasses multiple different terms, right? For example, if you are talking about neck dissection, then you might mean radical neck dissection, lymph node dissection, block dissection. So essentially what the database will do is say, fine, we'll have just one phrase and that will be part of our control vocabulary. And any other of these phrases will all slot into this one phrase. Okay, so if you have an article in these databases, every article will be tagged by a number of mesh headings. And if you search using mesh headings, then it helps to include articles that use any of these alternative names. Uh, because you're searching for that concept that is, uh, that is denoted by this particular mesh heading. And therefore, all the other articles that describe uh, the same concept using different terms will come up in your search. Okay, let's just do a, a quick um, example. Um, using the concept of central neck dissection. So let's go into the NLM NIH website very briefly. And then there is um, the database mesh. And if you want to look at central neck dissection, you write central neck dissection and then see whether this is actually a mesh. Central neck dissection is not a mesh because it says no item found. So then, uh, what you know is that central neck dissection is not coded for as a medical subject heading. So if you want to try neck dissection, yeah, you get neck dissection as a mesh concept. So they give you the meaning of that um, particular uh, mesh. The meaning is described. And they also tell you when the mesh was introduced. And this is important. This mesh was introduced in 2003. And I'll tell you in, in a minute why that is important. If you then go down, you will find that neck dissection is in the hierarchy of, um, in this particular hierarchy. So it comes under lymph node excision um, in one of the trees, and then it comes under otorhinolaryngologic surgical procedures in another uh, mesh tree, okay? So you could put that uh, mesh into the PubMed search builder, and then you can search PubMed if you want, right? So you got more than 8,000 articles on neck dissection as a mesh heading. So let's go back to our uh, discussion. Uh, to our discussion. So we found that central neck dissection is not a mesh term. So we used neck dissection instead. But obviously you do not want articles on selective neck dissections and lateral neck dissections and so on. So you want articles on central. So you add central or level six or level seven and so on to the mesh term using what we call Boolean operators. So you've probably all heard of Boolean operators. There are three basic ones, and, or, and not. The word Boolean really is after a guy called George Boole, who's, who's a mathematician. So there's nothing more uh, to it than, than that. And so you can use these operators to combine mesh words with keywords or multiple keywords. Just remember that if you use Boolean operators, you've got to keep in mind that the operator and takes precedence. That's the primary operator. And always uh, when you're searching in various search engines, just remember to write Boolean operators in all caps. Okay. Now, going back to mesh headings for a second. Now, although mesh headings are really uh, useful, you've got to be aware of some limitations. So the first one is that you may not have mesh for all of the concepts that you are interested in. For example, for central neck dissection, there is no mesh term. The other problem is recent articles may not have been meshed or mesh indexed. So if you've just got, if you've got an article in the last few months, they wouldn't have had the time to index it and give allocate mesh categories. The last problem is that um, mesh terms are added on a regular basis to uh, Medline, PubMed. So um, if your mesh term has only been added in the last 
few five years, for example, then the articles that uh, relate to this concept from five years ago will not be uh, retrieved because the mesh terms do not apply to articles published before they were introduced. So no one's going back retrospectively and tagging all the um, articles in history. Okay, so we've talked about mesh shedding and we come back to this table where we've got the concepts listed in this column on the left. We've got the keywords in the middle and then I've put down the mesh headings for the various concepts. So for central neck dissection, I've got just neck dissection as a mesh heading, so that is not sufficient. So I'll have to combine that with some keywords. And then for thyroid cancer, I've got a mesh heading. And for drain, I've got a mesh heading called drainage. Okay. Now, the next step uh, is to combine the keywords in the mesh to formulate the search strategy to then go on to search. Okay. Before we do that, we need to talk about a few more terminologies. So the first one is Boolean operators and or and not. We've already talked about this, so I won't dwell on it. The second um, terminology is what, what is what we call truncation. Now truncation is something that you adopt for the keywords where you simply add a symbol, asterisk in PubMed, to search for various variations in the keyword. For example, with drain, if you write drain asterisk, uh, the PubMed will search for drains, draining, drainage, and so on. PubMed needs at least four characters to truncate, and then uh, it'll search for the first 600 variations, which is much more than you will ever need. But the, the other um, uh, terminologies to, to, to know about is something called quotes and parentheses. Now, if you put something uh, within quotes, you could put a series of words within quotes, and then uh, the database will search for that exact phrase within the quotes, so that's quite useful. For example, central neck dissection. So it only search for um, papers where the full phrase is, uh, is included in that order. Parenthesis or the brackets is used for uh, nesting. And I'll explain what nesting is. So nesting helps bring together keywords and concepts to then form your final search strategy. And this nesting is done using parentheses. So, for example, if you wanted to uh, search for central neck dissection, you know that you've got neck dissection as a mesh word, and then you're adding central or level six or level seven. And just in case you're not familiar, level six and level seven are parts of the central compartment of the neck. So you pull these together with the Boolean operator or, and then you combine this with the neck dissection as a mesh heading and use the Boolean operator and, and you've got um, uh, the use of parentheses to nest the various phrases, the various uh, keywords together. Then you've got field tags. This is something I don't tend to use at all, uh, but if you wanted to limit your search to specific fields of a citation, and let's say you get 100,000 articles and you don't have the time to go through all of those, then you can um, specify that you only want to include those keywords if they, are, um, if they are within the title or within the title or abstract, or, or you could say if they're anywhere in the text. So these are tags without which all the fields of a citation would be searched. If you tag it to a specific field, then only that specific field will be searched. Okay, so yeah. So you come back to this table. Now the concepts are still there. And now you've got the strategy for each of these concepts. So for central like that section, you've got a strategy that combines certain keywords with the Boolean operator or, alongside the neck dissection as a mesh heading, and that's combined with and. Then for thyroid cancer, you've got thyroid neoplasms. And for drain, you've got either drain with asterisks or drainage as a mesh heading. Now, obviously you can change this. You can, you can, you can try different, um, different kinds of strategies and see what kind of results you get. So I, put, uh, I combined these, uh, these strategies for the three different concepts and put them in PubMed, and I got about 33 articles. Okay, and then I'll look at the 33 articles and, and see, um, and, and I might just read a few and that seem uh, good quality, and hopefully that'll answer my question. You've got to remember that these uh, search processes are or should be 
iterative. So you've got to be able to go back and modify the search, make some amendments, minor or major. And you can do that by either adding concepts or um, keywords or field tags or limits. And you can, you know, you can limit this by, by period or language and so on and so forth, right? So uh, in, in our specific example, um, we haven't talked about outcomes as a concept. So you could add a concept relating to outcome and that could be like bleeding or collection or reoperation. And that could be done to narrow the search even further from 33, you might find that you just get two or three articles on the use of drain after centralic dissection in thyroid cancer surgery. Okay, so I hope that was helpful. So I'll summarize what we've discussed so far. So we talked very briefly about foreground and background questions, and we've done this uh, in more detail in a previous talk. And, and then the, uh, these are the questions that you, uh, you will want to be, uh, you'll want to answer by doing a literature search. We talked about a number of search techniques, the basic searching, berry picking, pearl growing, citation searching, and concept building. We dwelled on concept building, and I very briefly um, and very quickly, I guess, ran through a concept building search using PubMed. We talked again quite briefly but hopefully um, uh, you've heard of these terms before, or if not, you can go and read about them. Uh, it's useful, I think, to be familiar with what these terms mean. Mesh, Boolean operators, quotes, parentheses, nesting, and field tags. And if you haven't done many searches before um, and you feel nervous about it, you'll get better really, really quickly with just a little practice. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep ramming your life with our surgical podcast.